continuing in Exodus. Last week we were in Exodus 24 looking at the covenant. What is a covenant? What are the parameters of a covenant? What are the details, the aspects of a covenant? What should we learn from this? And now we come to Exodus 25. Um, and I, I think I've talked about this before, but whenever I feel like I know where God is calling us to go for our next sermon series, okay, this is where we're going. This is the next book of the Bible we're going to be in. The first thing I do is I sit down and I read through the entirety of the book. And just as every thought comes to me of, oh, that's a, like, that would be a good thing to teach on. Oh, that would be, I just jot it down in my notebook. And so I have a very rough draft of here are the entire chapters of Exodus. Here's what I think we're going to teach on. Here's what, here's what stood out to me, what convicted me, what compelled me. Um, if you look at my rough draft, and there's a reason it's called the rough draft. If you look at my rough draft, I originally, when I got to Exodus 25, was thinking, okay, we're going to do about three or four chapters in one go. Because we are now into, we're coming out of the covenant and we're in the section where God starts giving the details of the sanctuary. This is how many curtain rings there should be. This is the type of stone you should use. This is the color thread you should use. And so I was thinking, okay, we're going to do one sermon on how God is a God of detail. God is a God of planning. God is a God of order, things like that, which is a beautiful, wonderful, totally biblically valid realization from the passage. But as we got closer and I was rereading Exodus 25 and rereading Exodus 26, I found that I couldn't even get to Exodus 26 because I kept stopping at the same place in Exodus 25. And so instead, we're going to be looking at the first 22 verses of chapter 25. I'll be reading from the ESV. If it sounds a little bit different from whatever version you're using, that's why. Uh, but if you are physically able, would you stand with me just out of respect for the word of the Lord, please? This is Exodus 25, starting in verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, speak to the people of Israel that they take for me a contribution. From every man whose heart moves him, you shall receive the contribution for me. And this is the contribution that you shall receive from them, gold, silver, and bronze, blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen, goat's hair, tanned ram skins, goat skins, acacia wood, oil for the lamps, spices for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense, onyx stones and stones for the setting, for the ephod and the breastpiece. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst. Exactly as I show you concerning the pattern of the tabernacle and of all its furniture, so you shall make it. They shall make an ark of acacia wood. Two cubits and a half shall be its length, a cubit and a half its breadth, and a cubit and a half its height. You shall overlay it with pure gold inside and outside. You shall overlay it. And you shall make on it a molding of gold around it. You shall cast four rings of gold for it and put them on its four feet. Two rings on the one side of it and two rings on the other side of it. You shall make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. And you shall put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark to carry the ark by them. The poles shall remain in the rings of the ark. They shall not be taken from it. And you shall put into the ark the testimony that I shall give you. You shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be its length and a cubit and a half its breadth. And you shall make two cherubim of gold of hammered work. You shall make them on the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub on the one end and one cherub on the other end. Of one piece with the mercy seat so shall you make the cherubim on its two ends. The cherubim shall spread out their wings above, overshadowing the mercy seat with their wings, their faces one to another. Toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubim be. And you shall put the mercy seat on the top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony that I shall give you. There I will meet with you, and from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim that are on the ark of the testimony, I will speak with you about all that I will give you in commandment for the people of Israel. Please join me in prayer. Lord, thank you for the specific nature of your word. Thank you for the detail of it, the depth of it, God. We could plumb this every day for the rest of our lives without stop and not reach the depth of your wisdom. And so we praise you for that. God, we do. We rejoice over everything that has happened this morning because it all comes from you. We do not sing without lungs created by you. We do not sing without air that you have placed in those lungs. And so we praise you for that. We do not hear the team. We do not hear the scripture being read without ears given by you. We do not gather without the means to build a place over the decades provided by you of your own. We return to you. And so we praise you for every reminder of your goodness that our just being here testifies to. We praise you for baptism. We praise you for commitment. We praise you for the love of family, all made possible by you. God, may all of this be an offering to you. May all of this be pleasing to you. May you remove me entirely from this time. 
may we decrease, may you increase, God. May these not be my words, may they be yours. Please, Lord, we need that. We desperately need that. We give you everything. We thank you for the opportunity to continue to worship by engaging with scripture. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. You can be seated. So we're going to go through these 22 verses and we're going to we're going to look at some really beautiful reminders and lessons and truths all building towards the same thing. I'm going to reread verse 1, verses 1 to 7. The Lord said to Moses, speak to the people of Israel that they take from me a contribution from every man whose heart moves him, you shall receive the contribution from me. And this is the contribution that you shall receive from them, gold, silver, and bronze, blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twine linens, goat's hair, tanned ram skins, goat skins, acacia wood, oil for the lamps, spices for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense, onyx stones and stones for setting for the ephod and for the breast piece. How many of you dropped your ram skin off in the basket in the back? The counting team has never once said, uh, Sam, we've got a big jar of oil. What do we do with that? So why these verses? What do we see from these verses? Why do these verses instruct us and teach us and sanctify the church today? Well, because we see some very beautiful, simple lessons. What does it say? Every man whose heart moves him. God is calling his people to a willful, joyful, personal ownership of participating in his ministry. And what do we see? We see that it doesn't just say, okay, bring this one thing. It's bring a variety of things, bring different things. You all are going to bring different things to the church, and that's okay. There should never be a sense of guilt or shame of, well, I can't give as much as so-and-so, or I can't give, give the same skill set as so-and-so. I can't help with the plumbing. I can't help with the meal prep for people who need it. I can't help with this thing. I don't have, that's okay. We're designed to give different things. We're designed to bring different things. It's gone all the way back to Exodus that God's people give differently as he has given them and as he has placed on their hearts. What do we see in Deuteronomy 16, 17? And we've done a sermon at greater length on giving, so we're going to go through these pretty quickly. If, if giving is something that's an unfamiliar concept for you, if it's a concept that you struggle with, that you wrestle with, how are we supposed to give? There's a sermon on uh, February 20th of 2022. Rewatch that. We spend the entire sermon talking about, okay, what does the Bible actually say about giving? But we're going to allow Exodus to remind us of these things. So what do we see? Deuteronomy 16, 17. Every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessing of the Lord your God that he has given you. Give as you're able. We don't say, if you remember, we I asked one guy, I said, hey, what's a generous dollar amount? And he threw out, I think, like $60,000. And he was like, yeah, that's a very generous dollar amount. So if you give less than $60,000, you are not generous. No, what if your income's 30000 So we're not going to impose a random figure and say, this is how much you need to give in order to be pleasing to God. God says, give as you're able. That's my call on your life. Proverbs 3, 9, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Give your best. Give your first. Not your scraps, not your leftovers. God says, no, I, I deserve your best. So that's what we are going to believe and strive for as a church. Mark 12, 41 and 44, he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums, and a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. And he called his disciples to him and said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box, for they all contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. God says, give humbly, give sacrificially. He says, I own the cattle on a thousand hills. And Malachi says, bring me what I'm doing and see if I don't pour out blessings on you. So giving is also an expression of trust in the Lord, a beautiful expression of trust that we get to participate in. 2 Corinthians 9, 7, each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So I love that this section of the sanctuary, the establishment of what God is laying out, begins with the people giving differently. That should encourage us rather than fill us with a sense of, well, I can't give like so-and-so. That's okay. We give in response to the call God has placed on our hearts. And the people of Exodus demonstrate that for us all the way back then. It's fantastic to see. And what are they giving towards? I love this next section of Exodus. This is Exodus 25. Let's reread verse 8, starting in verse 8 rather. So after the giving, after the contribution, after the participating in the ministry, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst. 
exactly as I show you concerning the pattern of the tabernacle and of all its furniture, so you shall make it. They shall make an ark of acacia wood. Two cubits and a half shall be its length, a cubit and a half its breadth, and a cubit and a half its height. You shall overlay it with pure gold. Inside and outside shall you overlay it, and you shall make on it a molding of gold around it. You shall cast four rings of gold for it and put them on its four feet, two rings on the one side of it and two rings on the other side of it. You shall make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. And you shall put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark to carry the ark by them. The poles shall remain in the rings of the ark. They shall not be taken from it. And you shall put into the ark the testimony that I shall give you. How many cubits is your living room? Do we still measure things by hand's breadth? So again, we come to these verses, we come to these details, and we say, okay, what's this have to do with my life today? This is language I don't use. These are terms I don't use. These are concepts I'm not familiar with. Isn't this one of those sections of Scripture that you can just kind of say, all right, cool, and you know, move past to get to the stuff that makes sense? No, pause, consider these, appreciate these, dwell on these, meditate on these, because what do we see in them? How did they begin these details? This call, the Lord says, make for me a sanctuary. What is a sanctuary? We would say we are in a sanctuary. That's what churches tend to call the room they gather in. Well, a sanctuary is a holy place. Specifically, a place made holy by the presence of the Lord. So see, when we say, oh, we're in the sanctuary, oh, the sanctuary is around that corner. Oh, that's how you get to the sanctuary. Recognize that we are making an appeal. We are acknowledging that this is a place that will only be made holy by the presence of the Lord. Lord, if you do not dwell here, if you do not fill here, if you do not lead us here, this is not holy. This is only holy because of you, God. So even the word sanctuary should call to mind an act of worship and a, and a plea, a prayer for the Lord to lead us. We see it in Hebrews 9, 1 and 2. Now even the first covenant had regulations for worship in an earthly place of holiness. For a tent was prepared, the first section in which were the lampstand and the table and the bread of the presence. We're going to get to that next week. It is called the holy place. What an unbelievable privilege. I mean, think on this for a second. So God says, hey, here's the holy place. Here's the sanctuary that I will dwell in, that my presence will be in. You get the opportunity to help it. You get the opportunity to help build it, to work on my behalf. I, I, I can't count how many times I've said this, and I will be unable to count how many times I continue to say this. It is not a burden to join in the ministry of the Lord. It is not a burden to be a missional life for the Lord. It is not a burden to give ourselves to the service of Christ our King. It is an honor. It is a privilege. It's a delight. It's a treasure. It's a gift. Does God need us? Did God need the people? As the one who created the acacia tree and caused it to grow, did God need the people to provide the acacia wood? No. Does God need you and I for the gospel to be effective? Does God need you and I to transform this world? No. He is omnipotent. He is omniscient. He is omnipresent. The arrogance I have to have to think, well, God can't possibly accomplish his mission in Mansfield if I'm not here. I mean, the hubris of that. So instead, we need to look at it and we see, okay, the God who does not need me gives me the opportunity to engage. Oh, that's cool. Oh, that's special. Oh, I get to be a part of the team. We got to, I'm so grateful for the example of my dad in doing this, my dad and my mom in doing this. There were projects that we would do in our house that they would let us participate in, and it made us feel a greater sense of ownership for the end result. There was a patio in Milford that we put in at the back of our house. And my dad explained to us, my mom explained to us, hey, as part of the family, you get the opportunity to help serve the family by working on this. And I remember digging and stamping down, and I probably didn't do as much work as my 12-year-old mind thought I did. But what a great picture of me engaging in the work of the Lord. Yeah, God and I got this. No, God got it done, Sam. Don't, don't be under any disillusions. But my parents allowed me to participate so that I could look at the finished project when my friends came over and be like, yeah, we helped do this. God says to his church, 
I'm giving you this opportunity. That's special. And then what else do you see about the sanctuary? Did you catch the detail in verse 9? Let me reread it in case we didn't. Exactly as I show you concerning the pattern of the tabernacle and of all its furniture, so you shall make it. God says, exactly as I show you, so you shall make it. The Bible's not Mad Libs. Anybody remember Mad Libs in the car rides? You read half the sentence and then you get to plug in the word that you want, which anytime it was, you know, eight-year-old Sam, it probably was booger. That's not the Bible. God doesn't say, okay, I'll come up with the first 90% of this verse and then I'll let you fill in the rest according to your preference, according to your choice, according to what makes you laugh, what makes you happy. He doesn't say, hey, here's the work I need you to do. You come up with the details. He says, no, exactly as I command you, so you shall do it. It's specific. It's detailed. It's laid out by an intentional, deliberate, omniscient, all-knowing creator. It's not up for us to color in how we think it should be colored in. And what are we talking about? Don't lose sight of this. We're talking about the sanctuary. We're talking about the holy place. God is saying, hey, I have come up with the details of what constitutes holiness, not you. You don't define holy. You don't define pleasing worship. You don't define biblically acceptable. You don't define truth. I have done that part. You submit to it. Well, this makes me feel your feelings are not the definition of holiness. Well, I like when your likes, your desires, your interests are not the measuring stick of holiness. You and I do not define holiness. Well, I behave this way because so-and-so behaved that way, but I can just... No, that is not the barometer of holiness. God says exactly as I laid out, so you shall make it. He says this for the sanctuary, for the temple. Cool, Old Testament, let's jump New Testament. What do we see in the New Testament? You and I, we are the living temple of the living God. We are the temple in which he has placed his Holy Spirit to indwell us. So if the Israelites back then couldn't apply their own ideas and their own definitions to, to linen, how much less should we I today apply our own concepts and standards of holiness to the temple? Well, this is what holiness means to me. Cool, you're not the definition of holiness. I am not the defining factor of what constitutes pleasing and acceptable to the Lord. He is, his word is, as he has revealed to us, as he has given us, treasure the Bible for what it is. God's word to his church. What do we see in scripture? We looked at Luke 6.46 just last week with the covenant. What is... Jesus said in Luke 6, 46, why do you call me Lord and not do as I command you? I mean, Jesus says to the people listening, why do you call me Lord and then not do as your Lord commands you? Surely we today would never look at God's calling of holiness and say, well, I'm going to do this, but you're still my Lord. No, God says I've laid out holiness. Live like it. Submit to it. Follow it. Don't redefine it. Don't neglect it. Don't set it aside. What do we see in Proverbs 4, 25 and 27, or from 25 to 27? Let your eyes look directly forward and your gaze will be straight before you. Ponder the path of your feet, then all your ways will be sure. Do not swerve to the right or to the left. Turn your foot away from evil. God says, here's the path. Stick to it. Don't turn your foot aside. I mean, in, in the grand scheme of spatial existence, is that a big difference? Would you say I'm still in the same place? I mean, generally speaking, right? That's not too bad. No, God says, no, 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 here's where your feet are. Don't do this. Don't do that. That's not holiness. That's not my sanctuary. That's not my dwelling. That's not my tabernacle. That's not the holy place. This is the holy place. Abide by it. Do as I command you. Faithfulness to God should permeate every aspect of our lives. We should see fidelity to his commands, to his calling, to his standards in every detail. There is no aspect of your life that the Lord is not interested in. There is no aspect of your existence. There is no aspect of your career. There is no aspect of your neighborhood presence that the Lord is not interested in and has not called you to be holy in. 
Well, I'm holy in these 99% ways of my life. Okay, God says be holy in the 100% of it. All of it. 1 Corinthians 10.31 So whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do for the glory of the Lord. We see going all the way back to the sanctuary in Exodus that God has said, these are my standards exactly as I show you, so you shall do. We must apply the same truth to our lives today. And we will get right now to why that's incredible. Why that's not overbearing. Why that's not too much. Why that's not micromanaging. No, why that level of detail and attention and intentionality is beautiful and wonderful and delightful. What do we see in some of these first details? Oh, man. And you might have picked up on the theme of the scripture that the worship team ministered to us with, of the song lyrics that we were ministered to with. What do we see in verse 17? You shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be its length, and a cubit and a half its breadth. And you shall make two cherubim of gold of hammered work. You shall make them on the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub on the one end and one cherub on the other end. Of one piece with the mercy seat shall you make the cherubim on its two ends. The cherubim shall spread out their wings above, overshadowing the mercy seat with their wings. Their faces one to another toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubim be. And you shall put the mercy seat on the top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony that I shall give you. There I will meet with you. And from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim that are on the ark of the testimony, I will speak with you about all that I will give you in commandment for the people of Israel. Where does God meet his people? From a place of mercy. From a seat of mercy. I mean, does that blow our minds? How many people I've talked to who have this conception of God as the angry God? God is the God who doesn't want anything to do with me. God is the God who would be disgusted by me. God is the God who would look scornfully upon me. And I I say to them, no, God is the God who meets his people from the seat of mercy. He says, this is where I will meet with you. This is where you will hear from me. This is who he is, who he has always been. My friends, my brothers and sisters, may this fill you with excitement. Psalm 119, 132, turn to me and have mercy on me. The psalmist is crying out to the Lord. He says, turn to me and have mercy on me as you always do to those who love your name. Nehemiah 9, 30 and 31, for many years you were patient with them. The Lord, you were patient with them, your people. By your spirit, you warned them through your prophets, yet they paid no attention. So you gave them into the hands of your neighboring peoples. But in your great mercy, you did not put an end to them or abandon them, for you are a gracious and merciful God. Daniel 9, 18, give ear our God and hear, open your eyes and see the desolation of the city that bears your name. We do not make requests of you because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. The mere act of prayer should fill us with a heart of worship. We do not approach God's throne to present our pleas, to present our supplications, to present our praise, our gratitude, because we somehow earned it or deserve it. We approach him and pour ourselves out. We make our pleas because of his great mercy. It's incredible. Micah 7, 18 Who is a God like you who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance? You do not stay for angry forever, but delight to show mercy. I mean, God says, hey, here is my sanctuary. Here is my holy place where my presence will be. How will you interact with me? Where will you interact with me? I'll be on the seat of mercy. Unreal. Beautiful. Unbelievable. I mean, does your heart not swell with joy? Does it not make you want to fall to your knees and praise that he approaches his people from a place of mercy? And before our sinful arrogance starts to say, well, yeah, naturally, I'm a good person. Like, of course. Have you not met me? I'm a delight. 
No, why should it remind us that that's so important? Because we need mercy. I mean, don't overlook that fact that God needs to approach his people from a place of mercy. God needs to approach his people from a place of mercy because if he did not approach me from a place of mercy, I would have been struck dead a long, long time ago. You would have been struck down a long, long time ago if the Lord did not approach you from a place of mercy. Romans 3, 10 to 12, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Psalm 41.4, I said, have mercy on me, Lord. Heal me, for I have sinned against you. The presence of the mercy seat should remind us from the very start that we desperately need mercy. And then we get to rejoice because God does not turn his back. He shows the mercy. See, that word mercy, the noun translated Hebrew, mercy seat in the Hebrew, is very closely related to, directly related to the same Hebrew word for atonement, for making atonement. And so the mercy is extended because Christ made atonement. He paid the debt that our sin demanded. He paid the cost that our sin, the very thing that, caused, that, that requires mercy, Christ made atonement for it. The words are, are so interconnected that you cannot separate the two concepts. Isaiah 63, 8-9 God is speaking. He said, surely they are my people, children who will be true to me. And so he became their savior. In all their distress, he too was distressed. And the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and mercy, he redeemed them. In his mercy, he atoned for us. He lifted them up and carried them all the days of old. Unbelievable what we learn just by studying the details of the construction of the sanctuary. We're reminded of these things, these truths woven throughout all the pages of Scripture, Old Testament, New Testament, beautifully interconnected, all pointing to the same thing. Christ is Lord and King and deserves to be known and worshipped as such. It's wonderful. The magnification of Jesus in the details of the sanctuary in Exodus 25. What else did we see about the mercy seat? Now this ties back to what we said a moment ago. Exactly as I tell you, so you shall make it. Do not swerve to the right or the left. Do not alter the tiniest detail. Ah, oh, that's overbearing. No, that's merciful. What did he say? What did he say in the very last verse there? Verse 22. So I will meet with you at the mercy seat, and from there I will speak with you about all that I will give you in commandment. God's commandments, God's details, God's specific structure and plan flows from a place of mercy. Do not miss that detail in verse 22, that it is from the mercy seat that God's commandments come. What does Scripture say? Deuteronomy 10, 12-13 and now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments and statutes of the Lord, which I am commanding you today for your good. What does it say in 1 John 5.3? For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. His commandments were given, were spoken to the people, were communicated, were taught from a place of mercy. Think about this. We're going to talk about painful things. Think about the grief and the anguish that would have been mercifully spared a family who followed God's commands for fidelity in the marriage. Think of the devastation that unfaithfulness in marriage causes to people. And we would have been mercifully spared if we would have followed his commands on faithfulness in the marriage. Think of the painfulness and the difficulty that is inflicted on foolish behavior, on unwise stewardship of our lives. That we would have been mercifully spared if we would have followed what God said. Think of the pain and the grief 
and the devastation and the destruction that has been wrought upon countless families in a church when leadership fails because they were hastily put into place. When they were unwisely installed, what did we look at a few weeks ago? Or in Bible study a few weeks ago, the summer Bible study, if you missed it, come talk to us, we'll get you the notes. Do not be hasty in the laying out of hands. Do not be too quick to say, yep, this person should lead the church. If we would have only followed God's high holy standards, could we have been mercifully spared? Perhaps. We don't know the future, but I do know God's commands are not burdensome. I do know God's commands are for our good. So when we set them aside, what would we have been mercifully spared if we would have only listened to them? What would we have been mercifully spared if we would have only lived by them? We reject it, and then we wonder why it's painful, why it's hard. I mean, how much sense would it make to any of you if you're like, hey, how'd your weekend go? And I was like, get this. A ridiculous cop gave me a ticket. Why? I was doing 70 and a 35. What's wrong with him? How many of you are like, yeah, that doesn't make a lot of sense. You really got wronged there. No, you're all shaking your head like, good, I hope they took your license away. So we look at the commands that God has laid out. We look at these commands that are not burdensome, that are given to us for our goodness, for our blessing, for our holiness, for our protection, from a place of mercy, and then we set them aside, and when things blow up, we go, God, what's, what's the deal? Why would you do that to me? Where were you? God's where he's always been on the seat of mercy, issuing commands, issuing a call to holiness by his specific details, by his specific parameters, from a place of mercy. He's not the one who's changed. He's not walked away from his seat of mercy. So don't miss that detail in Exodus 25, 22, that as he meets with his people from a place of mercy, he issues his commands on their lives from a place of mercy. It, it's... it's what an incomprehensible gift. If I spoke for the next 40 years, if I died without pausing to take a breath to stop talking about this, I would not have enough time to express the beauty of God's commands, the majesty of his standards of holiness. <laughs> and this is why I couldn't get past the 22nd verse of Exodus 25, no matter what my rough draft said. Because we need to meditate on these things. We need to appreciate these things. Because we have to understand mercy in our own lives as we reflect Christ's heart for the world. What does it say in Romans 12, 1? Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy. So everything that's about to follow, Paul is saying, therefore, in view of God's mercy, if you understand God's mercy, if you appreciate God's mercy, if God's mercy is an integral part of your life, in view of God's mercy... Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Proverbs 21.10, the soul of the wicked desires evil. His neighbor finds no mercy in his eyes. I mean, to withhold mercy is antithetical to the nature of God. So to withhold mercy, Scripture equates with evil. Hosea 6.6, 6, God is speaking, For I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. Zechariah 7, 8 to 9, and the word of the Lord came again to Zechariah. This is what the Lord Almighty said, Administer true justice, show mercy and compassion to one another. Matthew 5, 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. As we consider everything from Exodus, these are the standards for the sanctuary exactly as I show you, so make it. As we consider this standard of mercy and of holiness, God is saying to his people as the temple in the New Testament, okay, be merciful. This is exactly what I've shown you. Do it. And I have conversations with people and sometimes we misunderstand mercy and we think mercy is pretending like the wrong never happened. Mercy is pretending like the pain was never inflicted. You stab me, I have every legal right to press charges I choose not to. The scar doesn't magically go away. You still stabbed me. I still stabbed you. I'll be the one who did the stabbing. My apologies for that. You choose not to press charges. It's not like the knife wound goes away. Mercy is not pretending like we never felt pain. Mercy is not pretending like the sin never marred life. 
Mercy is not being naive. Mercy is not being ignorant. Mercy is choosing to respond the same way our Lord does to us. In love, in kindness, in compassion, in canceling the debt, and forgiving, and not retaining bitterness, not holding a grudge, not resenting, not slandering, that's mercy. Well, I don't know if I'm there, so I'm just going to not think about the person. I'm going to pretend they don't exist. I'm just going to delete them from social media. I'm going to block their number on my phone. And that way, I just don't have to acknowledge them. Is that how you want God to respond to you? Well, I can't bear to be merciful to Sam, so I'm just going to pretend like Sam doesn't exist. Is that what God said to you and I? No, God said, I love you. So I extend mercy to you. I do not ignore you. I do not pretend you're not there because I can't bring myself to be merciful to you. And no one has ever sinned against you and I worse than we have sinned against God. And in that, God said, I extend mercy. Who are we to not do the same? What's it say in Jude 1, 22 to 23? Be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by the corrupted flesh. Jude, Jude says, hate the sin. He doesn't say pretend like the stain's not there. Pretend like the sin's not there. No, Jude says, hate it. Show mercy to the one who committed it. So as we consider Exodus 25, as we consider God laying out the details, the very specific details of holiness in the sanctuary, Jerry, one of those specific details in the sanctuary today, in his people, in his dwelling place, is mercy. The mercy seat that he met with his people from, that he meets with his people from. The throne of mercy that he sits on. The mercy that he gives daily. What's it say in the Psalms? His mercies are new every morning. Satisfy me in the morning with your love. I mean, if you think about it, are you satisfied with your day? When's the best time to answer that question? As soon as you wake up or as you're drifting off to sleep? Oh, well, as I'm drifting off to sleep, because then I can look backwards and I can see, okay, did I accomplish enough today to be satisfied with my day? No, my friends, the Bible says, satisfy us in the morning, the time of day when your mercies are new. I lay down and I wake again because your mercy sustains me. That's when the satisfaction happens. Because every time the eyes open, it's, oh, hey, God showed mercy to me. All right, I'm satisfied with my day. My friends, who are we to not show the same mercy to the hurting world around us? If it's the standard of the tabernacle that he has laid out, why would we set it aside? I love the details of Exodus. I love the incredibly specific nature that God has instructed his people throughout time. And that he has given us a gift of it being recorded so that we can look back and see, okay, the same deliberate, intentional God who leads his church today is the God who led his people then. And we can allow his word to, to teach us, to refine us, to mold us, to make us more like Christ in every way, shape, and form. Because that is what we are called to do. To offer our lives as living sacrifices in view of his mercy. Mercy seat, man. He's never changed. There's never been a day when God has been any less merciful, any less faithful to his people. May we respond accordingly. As we consider these things this week, let's read 1 Kings 8 and Psalm 25, two chapters. 1 Kings 8, Psalm 25, we'll read them on Wednesday. We'll send out the video where Pastor Dawson and I talk about them, break them down, a follow-up Bible study. If you're reading them and you're like, ah, I don't see how the sermon ties in, check back with us Wednesday. That's why we do those midweek follow-ups. Pray as led by Scripture, allow God's Word to drive our prayer life. Allow Scripture to fuel our prayer, our supplications, our gratitude, our praise. Let's continue to remember, not just remember so that we can brag about memorizing scripture, but remember so that we can meditate it on it, we can store it up in our hearts, we can treasure it, we can delight in it. John 13, 34 to 35, Jesus says, this is how they'll know you are my disciples, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. Part of that love is mercy. So the reflection is, am I really loving like Christ if I won't extend the same mercy he extends me? 
Am I living like his disciple? If I'm grateful for the mercy he pours out on me, the faithfulness he pours out on me, but I hope you don't wrong me because I'm not as quick to show mercy. Am I really living like his disciple? Am I really loving like he's called me to? Lord, may this church live in love according to the standards of holiness you've set out for your sanctuary. Let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you for your eternal nature. Scripture says within you there is no shadow or variance due to change. Thank you that you are the same God who gave those details, those instructions for the sanctuary, who met with his people from the mercy seat, who issued commands from the mercy seat. Thank you that that is who you are today. Thank you that we have the opportunity, the privilege, the joy, the treasure, the gift of extending that mercy to the world, of reflecting your heart. I mean, we have such a wonderful opportunity to reflect our Savior simply by being merciful. May you fill us and lead us in that. I need you to sanctify us. May you do that this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Hey everyone, Amen. Pastor Sam here. Thanks for joining us for a Sunday sermon. If you're interested in more of the sermons from this series or some of our past sermon series that we've done, you can find them at discovercommunity.org under the sermon file. Uh, otherwise, you can subscribe to this channel to make sure you stay up to date on all our content. Thanks for joining us.